So I'm delighted to welcome Anna Ray Jones to the Martin Parr Foundation. We currently have uh, an exhibition of Tony Ray Jones on, so welcome Anna. Thank you so much. And tell me, how did you actually meet Tony? Um, <clears throat> it's a curious story. Uh, I was dating a fellow when I lived in Earl's Court in London as a much younger person, and uh, we went to a bar in Earl's Court uh, where mer British mercenaries hung out at the time, and the man I was dating was a filmmaker, and he was somehow, Tony and a group of American friends were there, and Tony was there on a mission to take portraits of these people. So we all commingled and chatted and over drinks, and later on we moved on to a party, and that's how we met. And at this point, he'd just come back from America. Yeah, he'd come back from America and he was working, uh, trying to get a foothold in London, working for uh, people like the Sunday Times magazine and um, the Observer magazine and uh, Time Life books and so forth. So he was slowly rebuilding a career in England. And tell me a bit about the time he had in America. There, I believe, he met uh, various different photographers and people like Brodovich. Yeah. I guess for him, it's a very formative period, uh, very formative time. It was a very formative time. And uh, Alexei Brodovich, you know, the great art director of all time, uh, ran the, um, correct me if I'm wrong, was it the photo lab or the photo arts lab? And Tony had a chair scholarship where he set out the chairs for, for, for the workshops. And, um, Therefore, he didn't have to pay. He didn't have to pay, no. Uh, but Brodovich very much became a father figure to him, and they enjoyed a very affectionate relationship. Um, Tony had a great respect for him, and uh, through Brodovich met people like Richard Avedon and um, Irving Penn and other luminaries of the time, and, and certainly people like Diane Arbus. Um, and... For the rest of Brodovich's life, Tony stayed very close to him. And when uh, Brodovich and his son retired to Provence, we would go down and spend summers uh, with the family. So. so we know he had this very strong desire to photograph in England because I guess he'd seen how the American photographers had, had handled the social landscape there, people like Winner Grand, Mayo. Yeah, and Bruce Davison met. and, uh, correct me, what... Uh, who, who, the man who did the Americans? Robert Frank. Robert Frank, yeah. Great influence, great influence on Tony. And, um, and of course, Bill Brandt. Absolutely adored Bill Brandt's work. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he built up to the idea that he should get on the road and go around England and see what the landscape was like in his period, um, as opposed to, obviously, Bill Brandt's period. Um, so he began to plan to do that and looked at various sources, um, how the English do being English uh, in various contexts and various landscapes. Um, and I, I think it's important to look at some of Tony's influences that are, are non-photographic, ranging from everything um, from seaside postcards, especially Donald McGill, <laughs> you know, the sort of schoolboy rudeness photo <laughs> postcards. Um, and everything from Hogarth to, to William Blake even, um, the kind of imagery, how can I say this, um, that might be off the beaten track but still has an influence and still has an impact. Uh, I hope I'm explaining this no, correctly. No, it sounds good. Okay. Yeah. So he went and bought a, a VW camper van. Yeah, he bought a VW camper van because uh, our plan was to travel to various locations where he could find the kind of imagery he was looking for, especially, of course, the English seaside. And to um, this was a way of not, not just doing it on the cheap, but you know, to go to all those locations, spend money on hotels, would have been quite an expensive enterprise. So the camper van served us very well. Uh, one could cook in it, sleep in it, park it anywhere, um, especially on the beach, and uh, and it was very useful. And how did you decide where to go? Well, he would look at f um, festivals, dates of festivals, um, 
and uh, you know peak period holiday periods for holiday makers on the beach things like Eaton Open Day the Dickens Festival uh, and we would go to those locations and he would you know put on his what he called his flashes raincoat where he, sometimes he would have a camera here and of course he would have a camera on his shoulder but he would have a camera here and take the what I call the surreptitious shot or he would say to me stand over there and pretend you're smiling at me <laughs> right? but what he wouldn't be shooting me he'd be shooting what was happening off to the right or left of me I was just the foil so you'd actually literally go around with him Yes. And would this be all day, literally from nine in the morning to uh, nine at night? Pretty much, pretty much. You know, moving down the street or moving down the beach or staying on the beach, waiting for the right moment. Often he had this um, intuition, if you will, that a certain kind of image could be found before he actually ever fa found it, you know, um, crude example would be, I bet I can get a shot of people eating uh, with sand in their sandwiches. <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, with or children, sitting, sitting on the beach in the rain. Or sitting on the beach in the rain, determined, <laughs> determined to have a good time no matter what. So if the weather was a bit dodgy, he'd be quite yeah. happy. Yeah, yeah, because it, it gave it gave a certain kind of mood to the image. Um, one of the things... And, and which I think was a really remarkable but simple observation. He would say, you know, no matter what, people always place their deck chairs facing the water, <laughs> which is really an interesting true, idea. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Nobody ever puts their deck chair with their back to the sea. Yeah. So what is it there in that relationship between ocean and person? <laughs> you know, what is, what is the sort of subliminal link, mm -hmm. you know? So. And did you sense immediately this sense of uh, real motivation, real stubbornness? I mean, he, he's known as being a very demanding, very driven person. On himself, yes. Yeah. Um, what did I notice? That he was never satisfied with, uh, you know, maybe a day shooting wouldn't necessarily bring him what he was looking for. So he would stay until he thought, you know, out of a day shoot, he had at least three or four good images um, and often he, we would revisit the same places mm -hmm. so um, yes there was a doggedness there absolutely a doggedness uh, I just want to talk about Bill Jay because he's very important in both my life and indeed right. uh, in Tony's life because there's this wonderful quote where he he knocked at the door of Creative Camera which uh, Bill Jay was the editor of yeah. and said your magazine is shit but I can see you're trying and I want to come and help I mean, what an amazingly confident expression of his values and what he believed in. Well, as much as I recall, and I could be wrong about this, the origins of Creative Camera, uh, you know, were a little bit basic, of course. Um, I don't know if people like wedding photographers subscribe to it. Uh, and uh, the publisher, Colin Osman, um, I, I don't think he had a very broad vision originally about what the the magazine would stand for down the road. But since Tony had all these links and connections um, on both sides of the Atlantic with, uh, you know, different kinds of photographers, uh, you know, he introduced Bill to a lot of people, people like Winogrand and, uh, uh, I know, the, the Magnum people, people in France, Martin Frank and Bresson and all those people. And of course, he actually took Bill to New York at one point to meet several photo luminaries. Uh, and it did, I think, upgrade, getting involved with those kind of people really did upgrade the quality of the magazine. No, for, for definite. And I think Bill had a conversion when he got to America and he realised the energy towards photography. Yes, he did. And the absolute quality of the photographers at yeah. that particular period. Yeah. Yeah, and Bill's, and I know that um, it sort of ignited Bill's vision uh, for the magazine, which I think never left him. As you know, he went on to have a quite a, um, a remarkable career. Uh, in America. A, yeah, in you? America, uh, uh, later on in life. 
So uh, and not before he'd actually founded and done twelve issues of Album Magazine. Right. Um, one of those issues, of course, has the famous yeah. Ray Jones uh, yeah. Eaton Boys. Um, it was short lived, but it was well intentioned. And I think it's important to say that you know Bill J had a big effect on me because it was he that introduced me to Tony Ray Jones myself because he came and gave a lecture about him at Manchester Polytechnic and oh, yeah. the whole of my year uh, and the whole of the college were absolutely intoxicated uh, by really? seeing these pictures of Tony. Now, let me understand one thing. This was post-Tony's death, right? It was No, no, it was before he died. It would have been in 71. Oh, okay. Right. And I think he when died you... in 72. Yeah, that's so, true. Uh, I remember reading uh, the the headline in Photo District News about yeah. Tony dying. So I, yeah. I would have known about him yeah. before he died. But of and, course, and, I, and, I never met him. Uh, that's unfortunate that you never met so for you, what, what, what do you find inspires you in Tony's Im Im imagery that informs your own? Well, I think for me, what he did is he learned the ways of that new shooting in America, you know, the way that it's as much as the, the difference between objects and places and people that counted, rather than relying entirely on the narrative, which is what had happened with that generation of, say, picture post photographers. So he brought that new language of photography back to the UK and he was the first person along with perhaps a few other people like say David Hearn who yeah, then applied yeah, those ideas and rules to photographing in England so it, it basically opened up the door for me to show me what was possible mm. and that was a great inspiration to me yeah and and your work is I mean it may have started there but it's also broadened out on so many levels I mean your your visual um vocabulary ranges far and wide it does but of course it's all built on those early days of learning yeah uh, so I want to come back to, to London I mean I read this story that uh, you came home one day to the flat and there was John Sikowski sitting in yeah. the living room tell <laughs> us about that having a cup of tea um, having a cup of tea I'd heard it was coming and um, I think we all uh, did a lot of frantic housework and I, I had to be elsewhere and um, and he it, a very, very charming man. I walked into the living room and there he was and Tony was sharing his photographs and certainly MoMA did acquire, I think, four or five key prints, key prints. One was hoping for a show, which never happened. Mm -hmm. uh, it would have been, of course, sensational to have had a show at MoMA, mm -hmm. uh, but we never got that far, so... And then he did have a show, uh, of course, famously at the ICA, I believe, yeah, the in 1969. Yeah, yeah. And, that, and we've actually got some of the prints yeah. from that original show. But tell us, uh, that was under the auspices of Bill Jay, I, I believe. Yes, it was. And, and I think thereafter, that show went into the basement of Creative Camera. And um, I know you have some prints from it. I never know what happened to the rest of them. Mm -hmm. There was a mysterious disappearance. So... So they might be out there somewhere. We don't know where they I are. I don't know. Um, I, I know that when Bill, correct me if I'm wrong, because I don't know much about Bill Jay's fate after album closed and creative camera closed. And I, he went to the University of New Mexico. He did, yes. Right, as a lecturer. And I believe by that time, Bill had accumulated a, quite a fantastic collection of um, photographs, I think, due to the demise of creative camera maybe they were uh, images submitted by photographers mm -hmm. that had been published i'm not sure they they were ever returned yes. or, or became bill's property yeah that was the case i mean we didn't really think about prints and the value of them because no one knew they had any value that's at, true at, at, that's at true that point in time. and i do know that bill in his lifetime accumulated quite a significant collection of pictures which i believe were deeded to the University of New Mexico. I, to be honest, I don't actually know that yeah. for certain. Um, so it would be, I've often um, thought about trying to explore what Ray Jones material might be mm -hmm. there. Yes, that, um, it could be interesting to find out. It, yeah, it would be interesting to find out. Uh, and this exhibition in, in London, how is it received here? Because this is the before the Photographer's Gallery had opened, so it would have been a very unusual photography show. It was extremely well received. It was extremely well received. It was one of the first of its kind. It was well reviewed. I don't, I don't no longer have any of the reviews. Maybe your wonderful staff could dig them out. Um, and um, it did result in... Actually, Tony getting a lot of different independent assignments 
you know, magazine assignments mm -hmm. and media assignments and stuff like that. So. And, and then you decided both to go uh, back to the States. Well, you went for the first time, I guess. Uh, yeah, and I went for the first time. So what, what was well, that uh, Jerry triggered Bouchard, by? Jerry Bouchard, who you may know from the San Francisco Art Institute, uh, had a, he had heard of Tony. So he came to visit us in London and uh, offered Tony a teaching position at the San Francisco Art Institute. I was in art school, so the switch was easy for me uh, to f finish up studying. Um, and also, uh, uh, Tony had connections with LA Magazine, so to go and teach in San, and live in San Francisco and commute to work for LA Magazine and, uh, and Time, Time Warner Books in Los Angeles was not such a big deal. And how did Tony take to teaching? Um, a bit spiky. <laughs> he broke no you know, no, if you were not serious and you were just doofering about with a camera, uh, he would let you know that, look, this is serious business. You've got to knuckle down. He was a harsh taskmaster. <clears throat> and you have to remember, it was, you know, the atmosphere of San Francisco, the counterculture, there was a certain sort of overlay of flakiness that you could get away with, you know, photographing yourself naked and call it art, which happened, actually mm -hmm. did happen. <laughs> Um, he liked students that were bright and, and earnest. I can't remember. I know there were a couple were really prominent. Um, one of the, his contemporaries, or a, a person doing her masters, was uh, Annie Leibowitz. Oh, really? Yeah, she was a graduate student at the Art Institute of San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And um, while they were never friends, he respected, even then, you know, she, you could see she had a unique vision and she was going to pursue it come hell or high water. Okay, that's interesting. I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, Annie Leibowitz, yeah. 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 And of course, now she's a household name. Exactly. And when he was there, I mean, was he photographing in America much as well? Yes. You know, he, um, he did a lot of um, shooting around San Francisco and uh, especially Christmas time with reindeers on rooftops and trailer parks and big Cadillacs, the whole sort of um, West Coast American visual vernacular, um, especially in LA. And um, uh, let's see, what else did he do? He had some intention to photograph rodeos and cowboys and um, all the glitter paraphernalia they wear. And a lot of that work took place in color, which I know you're aware of, mm -hmm. right? The, the, there's a lot of excellent color work done in those latter years. So I know he took very good pictures in America as well, but ultimately I would say the, the English pictures have this sort of no... He took a lot of pictures in America, many of which are very good. I've seen some of those. Yeah. We have some in the collection. But I think ultimately his English pictures have the real resonance. And I think that's because he understood the English and yet yes. applied this American language. Would you say ultimately that was perhaps his... Um, strongest body of work? I would, I would. And I think, as you can see in the exhibition you have here, there, uh, what is interesting, a lot of those images have sustained over 50 years. There's a timelessness about them. And I, I hate to, the idea of something becoming stuffy and use the word classic, but I think that they are, they have become classic landmark images and, and they are timeless. And I think they will remain so. And what do you think Tony would have thought about the idea of, of someone like myself going through the contact prints and looking for other images that perhaps he'd overlooked? I think we've got some very strong pictures that first were shown in the Science yeah. Museum, the Media Lab, and now have been uh, re-shown here. Well, I think, I think for the most part, he would be gratified to know that he might have overlooked something, you know, because, um, you know, he would laboriously pour over contact sheets and then say, well, I can't find anything good here. But then maybe a few days later, he would go back again and laboriously go through the same process again. And, and, uh, cause sometimes he might've missed a really good, a real spot on photograph. Uh, and that did happen more than once that, well, maybe I should take a second look and mm -hmm. maybe this one's not so bad and print it up and see what it looks like. And, um, so I think he would be gratified that you found gems that he might have overlooked mm -hmm. at the time. You know, because you can be too particular 
right, as he was, mm -hmm. too nitpicky. Um, and when, when he was out shooting and you were with him uh, and say he came back to the camper van, would he say, Anna, I think I've got a cracker? Yeah, he would. He would. <laughs> he said, I think I've got a winner. And a prime example of that is the Glyndebourne photo, mm -hmm. the, the couple with the cows and dining in the field. And he was, I've just seen the most fantastic thing. You wouldn't believe what it looks like. Right. So... And he's absolutely right. That is one of his all-time uh, classic yeah, images. Yeah, and and uh, it, it w it's nice to think that he, you know, he scored a hit. He scored a hit visually. So, so how we, here we are, fifty literally fifty years 50 later years, since yeah. the English scene, and now we have another exhibition called the English scene. Yeah, tell me how you reflect upon the interest that Tony and his and his legacy have really generated. It, it must be very affirming for you to see yes, the is. position that he and the respect with which he's held. Yeah, um, I mean, for a person who had a short life and a short career. I think he is a landmark in uh, British photography, that a landmark that pointed the way for others such as yourself and a whole new generation of British photographers. And I think his place in history is assured and I, I don't say that with any arrogance. Um, I think that he is important in the pantheon of British photography uh, as, a, as a signpost uh, of where to go, how to go, what to look for. Um, and, uh, and it's amazing that his reputation has sustained for so long. And I hope that will continue. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. You're and, very welcome. Um, it's been great to have you and thank hear you. your and thoughts. And thank you for everything you've ever done for Tony's photographs. I mean, you've been a lifetime fan and I'm very grateful. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you.